Hi, um, welcome to this uh, alumni festival session. My name's Megan Davis Wikes. I'm a lecturer at the Department of Engineering and uh, a fellow of Murray Edwards College. So this talk is the science behind sash windows. So as I said, I'm a lecturer in the Department of Engineering. Um, and this work was done, uh, the experiments were done by Gail Kemp, who is, uh, was an undergraduate at the time and is now starting his PhD, and Paul Linden, who is a professor in the Department of Mathematics. Okay, so I kind of wanted to start out um, just describing the kind of breadth of the sort of research that I do. So I'm a lecturer in fluid dynamics, um, and here are a few videos from some projects that I've been involved in. So this first one is uh, a candy sphere, which is dissolving in water. And I did a project looking at how things change shape as they dissolve. So how like the interaction of flow and shape um, kind of creates some really interesting dynamics. And it's important for like the formation of landforms um, and understanding the kind of uh, channels underneath glaciers, lots of interesting things like that. Um, and then this is another project I was working on, uh, looking at splash and spray from a wheel. So this is a very slow down video of the splash thrown behind a partially submerged wheel. Um, the uh, fluid there is non-Newtonian, so the shear stress um, determines the, the viscosity, which is why it's kind of doing this cool tearing thing um, hereabouts. And then this is a large bulk of my research is looking at mixing. So this is uh, a simulation um, of fluids of different densities mixing together um, due to something called the Rayleigh-Taylor instability. Mixing is very important um, for understanding and modelling the ocean. So from the very big to the very small, um, the last kind of section of my research I did was looked at uh, like tiny like microscale particles and what happens when you uh, make them such that they kind of create a flow around themselves. So these are like rods of uh, platinum and gold. When you stick them in some fuel, they create a flow and they can self-assemble into these little shapes, a uh, little rotor, um, and also kind of how to steer them because um, at the very small scale, things don't act quite the same way as they do um, at the much bigger scale that we're used to. Um, like inertia is not the same. So here's a, an example of a little microscale swimmer being steered by teardrop shaped posts um, in the, the environment in which it's swimming. Right, so, but I'm not gonna talk about any of that today. Today I'm gonna to talk about ventilation. Um, so this is uh, Ham House owned by the National Trust who took this photograph. Um, and you might notice that there are a sort of quite familiar site in the UK, sash windows. Um, and these date, like the, these windows of this sort date to like the 1600s. Um, it's not quite clear who invented them, possibly Robert Hooke, um, although it might have been the Dutch, because I think this was in the, the Dutch style. And they're actually quite a clever piece of technology um, that almost everyone uses wrong. So to, my data on this is uh, a photograph I took on the 21st of May. Um, and it was, uh, this is on my daily allowed exercise. Um, it was 26 degrees, so it was quite warm. And this is a row of buildings, all of which have sash windows. And those outlined in red, uh, they're using their sash windows wrong. So uh, by the end of this talk, you'll understand what I mean by that. And you can have that smug feeling whenever you see a sash window being used wrong in the future. So I counted as 14 windows here and uh, 12 of them are, are being used incorrectly. So uh, that's 86% of people. So you can be part of the 14% uh, the, um, to get it right. Okay, so sash windows, what drives the flow? So at a sort of most basic level, um, the inside air is warmer than the outside air. So this is like a kind of model room with just a single opening in the side. Um, hot air rises and flows out the top of the window and cool air flows in through the bottom. So to be a bit more precise about this, um, the uh, pressure gradient um, is equal to minus rho g. So rho is the density, g is gravity. This is basically saying that um, the pressure pushing on you is equal to um, 
just sort of how much stuff the air there is above you pushing down um, and so as you move upwards there's less stuff on top of you so the pressure decreases uh, and the density this rho um, is proportional to uh, 1 over t so t is temperature and if indoors is warmer than outdoors then uh, the pressure gradient the magnitude of the pressure gradient indoors is, is lower so in other words this line here is shallower um, so when you compare the pressure indoors and the pressure outdoors there'll be some point where these two are equal and then above that height where the pressures are equal um, there'll be a higher pressure indoors um, which will tend to push air out through the window and uh, below this height um, there'll be a higher pressure outside which will tend to push air through the window into the room um, and then this height is actually determined by the fact that if this is a closed room then what goes in must come out and have to conserve volume so uh, this height is actually determined by that uh, constraint so if you integrate over all the stuff that's coming out and integrate over all the stuff that's going in, those two things have to be equal. Okay, so why is it hotter indoors? Uh, well, one important reason is that people are heat sources. Uh, so we produce a lot of heat, so do things like computers. Um, and here's uh, the thermal plume ri rising off um, uh, a seated man. Uh, this is the visualization here is, is um, known as synthetic Schlieren. It's kind of like the heat haze you see rising off a, uh, a road on a hot day. Um, and this video was made by Professor Stuart Diel, Rajesh uh, Kumar and Maxim uh, Donoff of the Maths Department. Okay, so what I do a lot of is reduced scale experiments. So doing experiments in air is very tricky. Um, particularly if you're trying to do things at full scale, so like of a real room. Um, this is partly because just making measurements is quite difficult. Uh, also for visualizing the flow is quite tricky. Um, what's much easier is doing uh, these experiments in water. Uh, and because of the uh, difference in viscosity between water and air, you can scale down a room uh, by say a factor of 10 and uh, get the same uh, uh, the two experiments, the two cases will be dynamically similar. So the, the physics of the both is identical. Uh, so this is my model room that I did some experiments in. It's uh, about um, 30 centimetres cubed. Um, and I've got these two windows with uh, sponges uh, squidged in them at the beginning of the experiment, um, which are pulled out uh, to start the experiment and inside the room I have water that's been dyed and is slightly warm um, compared to outside. So we can see what that looks like. So here I've got a room and the water inside is four degrees warmer than outside and it's got windows on either side and uh, when we pull out the sponges we get the sort of what we expect. So flow um, goes out through the window at the top and in through the window at the bottom. Um, and this is a sort of symmetric case. Uh, and ventilation will just kind of continue until we've removed all of the warm water below the top of the windows. Uh, yeah, and the, the kind of visualization here is partly the sort of complex uh, flow patterns you see is to do with the refractive index changes, um, but the color is like a false color to do with uh, dye attenuation. So because I've dyed the inside of this, this, this room. Okay, so sash windows are a little bit different because sash windows, you've got this extra thing, which is that uh, it's not just a single opening. You can have up to two openings, um, depending on how you arrange the sash, uh, the two pieces of glass in the middle of the window. So let's imagine I'm gonna describe this geometry um, through a, uh, a lower opening of h, height h lower, some height of the sash, which can be as little as half the total window, window height. And then the, uh, the total height of the uh, window is uh, h and the width is w. And we can set this up in different ways. So for example, we can have two openings where we put the sash in the middle of the window. 
Um, and in that case, what we would expect to see um, is outflow through the top opening and inflow through the bottom. Uh, we can also set this up such that we have uh, the sashes at the bottom, so we just have one opening at the top of the window. And in that case, we're going to get bi-directional flow through a, that single opening, because we still have to um, satisfy this uh, conservation of, of uh, mass, or conservation of volume in this case. Um, so uh, there are in fact three possible regimes here. We can have a uh, bi-directional flow at the top opening if the top opening is large and the bottom opening is small or zero. We can have a unidirectional flow through both openings, so um, just one way. And we can also have a uh, bi-directional flow through the bottom opening if the bottom opening is large and the top opening is small. Um, and at this point, we probably want to calculate uh, some flow rates. Like if we're gonna ask what setup gives us the highest ventilation rate? Uh, we need to be able to calculate what the flow rate is going to be. Um, and to do that, we effectively we use uh, conservation of energy. So uh, effectively, we're using Bernoulli's equation, uh, for those of you who know what that is. Uh, another way you could think about it is that the change in kinetic energy per unit volume is equal to the change in potential energy per unit volume. Um, because uh, density here is just mass per unit volume. So this, this is really potential energy. Um, this, uh, these pair of equations, we've got two equations, but we've got three unknowns. We want to know what V out is, what V in is, um, and we don't know where Zn is yet. So then our last, co last equation that like, determines Zn is uh, that the flow rate going in must be equal to the flow rate going out. So in other words, the integral of v out must be must equal um, over the range z is larger than zn must be equal to the integral of v in over integrated over z is less than zn so just the bottom half okay so this is what you get <coughs> so this y-axis here um, is the flow rate q through the window going out um, divided by, or uh, normalised by Q window, where the Q window is just a, a way of um, normalising Q, and it's just the flow rate you would get if there wasn't a sash, if H sash was zero. Um, then on the lower axis, on the X axis, we have um, H lower uh, normalised such that it goes between zero and one. So H lower going from as small as it can be, so no, no lower opening, to as large as it can be, which is um, H minus H sash. And then these different coloured lines are varying the size of the sash. So the smallest it can be in a real sash window is uh, 0.5. So that's like half the window is uh, blocked and half the window has op is open. And then as we move along this X axis, essentially we're just making the uh, lower opening bigger. So we have three regimes. Um, this like dotted line uh, is the when we have bidirectional flow at the upper window because the lower window is too small. Then the solid line we're having we've got unidirectional flow, so um, uh, like unidirectional flow through both openings. And then the dashed line we've got bidirectional flow at the lower window. Um, and we can see that the, the highest flow rate happens when we have equal sized openings at the top and the bottom of the space. Um, and the lowest, open, lo lowest flow rate happens when we have um, uh, essentially uh, one single large opening. Um, and it doesn't matter if it's at the top of the window or the bottom of the window. Um, that's the lowest flow rate. Um, so, we might want to compare our uh, sort of model to some laboratory experiments. So these are some experiments that Gail did. And you can see, you can see we've got uh, a tank, which is uh, photographed here, and it has two sections to it. So it has a, uh, two compartments. And we fill one of these with salt water, which is sort of playing the part of cooler air, and one half with fresh water. We then, uh, pull out a gate in between the two compartments, which allows 
wa uh, water to flow through uh, this kind of um, model uh, sash window, which, which has like opening sizes that we, that we uh, determine. And then we visualize this by using a projector, which reflects off a 45 degree angle mirror, um, comes through the tank and projects onto the screen. So what, what we're sort of seeing is um, sort of variations in refractive index. So here are a couple of uh, movies from experiments. Uh, here we have unidirectional flow through both openings, like there isn't um, any flow coming through this bottom opening, or rather there's a little bubble because it's sort of right on the edge. Um, and then uh, where, whereas in this um, example, we've made the lower opening just a bit bigger and the top opening just a bit smaller. Um, and as a result, we've now got bidirectional flow through the lower opening. Uh, and we can compare this to, uh, some, to, the, to the, these results from experiments to uh, the model. So the, we get Q, the flow rate from um, the overall change in density between the two uh, compartments, because while, it, while it's ventilating, while it's exchanging flow, the density of the the two compartments is changing and from the change in density we can get Q, although we have to do quite a few repeated experiments um, to, to reduce the error. And as you can see, the, uh, this is uh, the flow rate Q versus the size of the lower opening for a set uh, alpha, for a set like fraction um, of open area. And then this one is Q versus uh, the fraction of open area, so the versus H sash. Okay, so now the sort of final bit of my talk is just um, how much better is it to have two openings, one at the top and one at the bottom, than a single large opening? Because it sort of feels like you're going to get the most flow with the biggest opening, but that turns out just to not be true. That's like the worst thing you can do. So these are the equations for the best as in the largest flow rate and the uh, worst as in the smallest flow rate for some given h sash over h so some given um, opening area and if we have the window as open as it can go so we um, we have h sash over h is equal to 0.5 which is like half the window is opening and half of it is uh, it has the sash in front of it then it's almost twice as good it's, you get almost twice the flow rate if you uh, arrange it such that, that there are sort of roughly equal opening areas at the top and the bottom of the window. So it's like much, much better in terms of increasing the ventilation rate. And if you have a smaller opening, so say like 0.9, uh, like 90% of, um, of the window is still covered by sash, then it's almost five times better to have that opening split over the top and the bottom. So it's like really substantially different. Um, there probably is a situation where you would want to have one single opening. For example, if it's a very cold day outside, but you still want to have uh, your room well ventilated, then you might want to just open the top window because then that allows the incoming and outgoing flows to mix together um, and reduces a kind of cold draft uh, that you might get otherwise. Right, so that is uh, essentially the end of my talk. So. Um, the sort of main message I wanted to say today is that if you just open the, the top or the bottom of your sash window, you get the lowest flow rate. Um, whereas if you open the, the top and the bottom to sort of roughly equal areas, then you get the best flow rate. And that's even more true for small openings. And I also want to thank uh, Gail Camp, who did uh, the uh, experiments, uh, who was in his undergrad at the time, but now is starting a PhD. Um, and uh, Paul Linden, who is a professor in the mathematics department um, and who I collaborated with on this research. Um, this was uh, part of the MAGIC project, which is Managing Air for Green Inner Cities, um, which is looking at like, ways we can encourage people to use natural ventilation, um, which is an EPSA Grand Challenge project. And uh, now time for Q&A. So I'll stop sharing my screen so I can see all your questions. Thank you very much for listening. Right, what have we got? Okay, so um, the first question I've got is, in using water 
as uh, analog for air, how does it affect the result that water is incompressible? That's a really good question. So um, the sort of velocities that um, you would expect to see in building ventilation, um, the compressibility of the air just isn't relevant. Like the compressibility, obviously water is incompressible. Air is essentially, you can treat it as incompressible unless you're traveling close to the speed of sound uh, when it starts to really matter. Um, but uh, uh, the sort of velocities that you would see for building ventilation, it's not significant. Uh, okay, so then Janet, uh, and I've got another question, which is, uh, what is the effect if there are two single openings on opposite sides of a room? So kind of like the experiment I showed. Um, so if um, you can get wind driven ventilation set up, um, so you have wind blowing on one side of the building that can be a lot more effective than just simple single sided uh, with a single opening. Um, the, uh, so then that's a whole other talk which I have done some research on. Um, and in that case wind and buoyancy, like wind and um, temperature can interact in some interesting ways uh, to result in some uh, in, in ventilation. It's also kind of interesting if the openings are at different heights if you have two openings if you have two different openings then it stops being the height of the window or the height of the opening that matters and it becomes the height difference between the two openings that's important for driving the flow right do you have any thoughts for the implications for movement up of particulate matter through the sash i'm thinking air pollution um so this is a really yeah this is a very important thing to think about uh when you're um bringing in outside air I think um, quite a lot of the time, particularly in our homes, the main sources of pollution are not outside, like unless you're next to a kind of motorway, they're actually indoors. They're from cooking and cleaning and from um, uh, sort of candles, that sort of thing. Um, so in fact, uh, quite often the air outdoors is cleaner than the air indoors in terms of particulate, um, and like in terms of air pollution. But it kind of does depend on where you live and how effective your extractor fan is. Uh, right, so was the sash window designed for ventilation or was it just a pragmatic and aesthetic way of making an open window? I think probably a bit of both. Like I think the best engineering, and they're certainly kind of popular or they were popular in Victorian times. Um, but it is also quite a clever way of doing this because, uh, so something maybe you didn't notice, but that, uh, for the sash window, um, when you have it open as much as possible, and you compare that ventilation through that opening with the uh, opening that, uh, sorry, <laughs> got mixed up. If you compare the ventilation rate through uh, a sash window that's as open as it can be, and then compare it to the ventilation rate you would get if you took the bits of glass out, so you just had a, a, like a rectangular opening, even though you've only got half the area, you've got more than half the ventilation rate. The ventilation rate is like 0.65 times the ventilation rate you would get if the sash wasn't there. Um, so it's quite kind of clever in the fact that the thing that's forcing the flow is the height differences that's to do with the height and the temperature difference. Um, and so it kind of maximizes the height difference you can get between openings. Uh, in the chart of results, the curd appear to be exactly symmetric. Surely uh, the sash, uh, surely the slight difference in volume between the hot and cold air would make the curve slightly asymmetric. Ah, okay, so there's something called the Boussinesque approximation, which is essentially um, refers to the fact that the density differences are small compared to the absolute density. So yes, they are very slightly asymmetric, but it's so small that essentially it's not something you'd be able to see on a figure. Um, and it's often something we neglect in our models and kind of, um, yeah, in, in like the mathematical modeling of these things. Uh, anonymous NT, thanks Megan. <laughs> um, should I close my curtains to cut down the effect of the sun or does this counteract all the benefits of the sash and air circulation? So, um, yes. So, I mean, I, what, what I do is I have the, um, on the sunnier side, I have the, uh, the, the curtains closed during the hottest parts of the day because um, 
uh, you're sort of trying to balance the heat you lose through ventilation with the heat you gain from uh, the sun's radiation. Um, and I think probably um, the sun wins in the middle of the day and then the ventilation wins um, at uh, the sort of the morning and the evening. Uh, most, uh, your results suggest that most non sash windows are very badly designed for good ventilation or had I misunderstood. So there are various other types of windows and I'm not an expert on all types of windows um, or even most types of windows. So I mean if you have a window that's very tall that's essentially taking into taking advantage of the same effect as a sash window. You sometimes see these uh, very tall narrow um, windows particularly like office buildings. And they're using the same the same effect as a sash window does. Um, the the sort of uh, windows you sometimes see, which are very short and near the top near the top of a room, they're meant to like enhance the mixing between the incoming and outgoing streams to avoid drafts. Um, and they might be trying to use a stack effect, like the height difference between openings to drive a flow. Um, but I'm not sure. Ah, the ventilation model works well for no wind, but what happens when there is wind to drive the flow? That's uh, an excellent question. I've done a whole other <laughs> research project on that, which I didn't have um, time to show. Um, so uh, you can look at the, the effect of wind and uh, temperature on uh, rooms with two windows. So on opposite sides of the room. And in that case, wind is pretty much always good. Um, if you have, uh, like buoyancy tends to very slightly suppress the ventilation due to wind when it's buoyancy dominated, as in when temperature is really important, um, but it's quite, it's quite small. Um, the uh, wind driven cross ventilation tends to be the most effective. If you have one wind, uh, sorry, one window um, on one side of the room and that's that's it, then uh, it's a bit more complicated. Um, and I don't think it's really fully understood. We don't really understand single sided ventilation as well as we do cross ventilation or uh, buoyancy driven ventilation, which is what I've been describing. Um, right. Uh, how did you determine how big of a model you would need to make? Um, so I looked at um, there's sort of two uh, dimensionless numbers that are important. Um, so there's the Reynolds number and the Peckley number. The Reynolds number is essentially saying like how important is our viscous forces um, to inertial forces. And I wanted to make the Reynolds number to be in the same kind of range as for the full scale. And um, so for my, um, my experiments, I scaled the sort of full scale room effectively down by a factor of 10. But the viscosity of water, the dynamic um, kinematic viscosity is um, 10 times uh, smaller as well. So those two things balance out and you get roughly the same value of the Reynolds number. Um, the Peckley number is like how is heat being transported? Like, is it being transported because a blob of fluid is being carried along by the flow, or is it being transported because it's sort of diffusing outwards? And in uh, the full scale, the um, the what's happening is it's the blob of fluid being carried along that's happening much more, as in the Peckley number is large, and so that's also true for my experiments. So, so long as I had those two dimensionless numbers in the right range, I knew that my experiments in the laboratory were going to be correctly modelling experiments in the field. Right. Um, if there is a fan in the room, it will have to be set to draw air up to the ceiling, otherwise the mix will inhibit the cooler air flowing out of the lower part of the windows. Have you looked at the effect of fans? Uh, no, I haven't. And actually that is quite interesting um, because uh, stratification so if you have like a layer of cool air near the bottom and a layer of warm air near the top of the room can um, can negatively affect the ventilation through a window so potentially it could enhance um, the the ventilation by kind of mixing all the air in the room together um, but it depends I think there are two ways you can use a fan you can either use it to 
to be pulling air up to the ceiling and mixing it round, which is often the sort of winter mode fan, or you can switch it the other way and have it blow air down, which is trying to create a breeze um, and thereby cool you, which is sort of summer mode. Uh, but yeah, there's, like, there's lots of interesting questions about fans. Um, right. If sash windows are so good, why don't other countries have them? Um, Oh, that is a good question. That's, that's probably more a history question than for, for me. I think it matters that we're in a pretty temperate climate, as in we can leave the windows open for an awful lot of the year. Um, so I think that's part of it. Um, there's uh, hotter countries, you often need to have a much higher ventilation rate. So there you do things like you have um, these big chimneys um, if you look at houses in Spain, you'll often see them that are trying to catch the wind and increase the slack effect, so the, the effect of temperature by having a much, much taller height to act over. Um, so, yeah. Uh, something similar on chimneys. I'm afraid I'm not quite sure what that question means. Uh, are there practical applications for this other than for sash windows? Hmm. I, I think um, I was very much sort of focused on on the sash windows. Um, I think uh, uh, certainly like buoyancy driven flow is like um, very common uh, phenomena. So um, yeah, there are like lots of other situations where similar models are quite useful. Um, is the sash window better than ordinary tilting windows if you had two openers, top and bottom? I don't know, actually. Uh, so this is where I kind of get a bit stuck because I, I don't know as much about tilting windows as um, I would like. Um, I think they're trying to do roughly the same thing, so have an opening at the top and an opening at the bottom. Um, but obviously the sort of tilt, tilted window bit um, affects the flow um, and does sort of matter, but it's, it's trying to do basically the same thing as a sash window. Uh, I think it would depend on how tall you can make a tilted window compared to how tall you can make a sash window. Um, okay. How do other factors affect the efficiency of a sash window? For example, opening the door in the room, external wind blowing against or parallel with the window? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, so, uh, opening a door in the room, um, you could enhance the flow because you could introduce a kind of some cross ventilation, um, which does tend to enhance the flow rather than inhibit it. Um, wind blowing against the window um, and power wind windows, that sort of single sided ventilation thing again, which uh, we have models for it, but it's not something we really fully understand, I would say, uh, despite the fact that it's really um, common. Uh, Right. How are you planning to share this information with those living in older homes with such windows or even older buildings like Girton College? Um, well, so I mean, it's not some of this is not um, uh, staggering in you. It's just not very well known, if that makes sense. Um, although there's some of the stuff on, um, uh, on understanding all the different flow regimes is new. Um, but knowing that the way to use a sash window, you have to open it at the top and the bottom. Um, that's uh, uh, in, in theory been known but just sort of been forgotten. Um, so uh, and I certainly want to share this research um, particularly looking at the flow regimes um, the, uh, and, and the process of writing a paper um, on that and then we'll yeah publicize it and stuff. Um, sorry I'm a scientist so I'm not very good at that sort of thing. Um, okay uh, are there economically attractive modern sash windows for social housing? Uh, that is a good question, but I'm afraid I don't know the answer. Um, that's, yeah. Okay. Sounds as if sash windows are the bee's knees. Ventilation, how do other window formats compare? Um, I guess it kind of depends on um, uh, what we're trying to do. Um, it's um, uh, like how much ventilation you have, what the occupancy of the building is likely to be, what the room is going to be used for, like, you know, if it's cooking versus if it's something else. Um, so there's a kind of a lot of factors that would play into that. Um, another question on hinged windows, which I've already talked about. Uh, 
Okay, what research is there in Cambridge about air flows from individuals breathing inside a closed space with ventilation in the case of COVID-19, masks necessary or does the ventilation rap rapidly evacuate droplets and aerosols from the breath? Uh, very tropical question. So Stuart DL, who I mentioned, uh, there's a video um, by him earlier in the talk, he's doing some really fascinating stuff um, looking at um, the sort of uh, plume from the from the breath and how that interacts with ventilation. Uh, Paul Linden and Rajesh Kumar are also doing some very interesting research on this. So um, yeah, I guess sort of watch this space. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of a lot of interest in this at the moment. Um, I would say masks are necessary. Um, I think they're actually really important. Um, one really uh, interesting thing they do is they change whether your breath goes out or goes up in your body plume um, and then that can affect how um, how things uh, uh, get removed by the ventilation system um, it can mean that the ventilation system can remove things a lot more effectively than if you weren't wearing a mask so that's uh, like one of many reasons why mask wearing is very important, particularly indoors. Uh, would the same conclusions re relating to a number of openings apply if you have modern sliding windows, if your openings are vertical and not horizontal? So a lot of, a lot of that would sort of apply, but um, it actually kind of gets a lot simpler because you only ever have uh, an opening of some height and you're just, the width is changing. Um, and so it's much, much easier to work out what the ventilation rate is going to be. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that's um, um, a lot of the, the conclusions wouldn't would be different in the sense that there aren't different arrangements of the window um, in the same way. It's just make the window wider and you'll get more ventilation because um, it's always the same height. Uh, how does the relative ventilation compare between an opening of length H with no window at all and a window with two equal openings and H sash is 0.5. Ah, yes, okay, so um, in that case, the ventilation, the ratio of those two is 0.65-ish. Um, so that was the, the top of the, what, the graph that I showed at one point, in the, but I didn't really highlight it as much as I could have done. So it's the, the ratio of those two rates, the rate with no window, with no sash at all, just an opening of height H. And when the H sash is 0.5, and there's equal size openings at the top and bottom, the ratio of those two ventilation rates is 0.65, where one with H sash 0.5 is smaller. Um, when sashes were developed in Stuart times in England, as I understand it, presumably for much of the year, people wanted to get rid of smoky air from fires while minimizing heat loss. Do sashes address this issue better than casements? I, I don't really know the answer to that question. Um, if I had to guess, I would guess that it's more like for smoky air from fires, it's more about making sure you have good ventilation and you have a good chim, like a well-designed chimney. Um, so I don't know that that would make a huge difference. I, I don't know quite enough about that though, I think, to, to speak to it. Uh, have you compared uh, flow dynamics of sash windows to those typically used in modern dwellings, e.g. top opener, side opener, which is superior, having regard to modern trickle vents. So yeah, this is sort of similar to a question from earlier in the sense that um, it kind of depends what you're trying to do. Um, uh, the, uh, the point I'm making is not so much that sash windows are like the best window, um, but that they can be used more effectively than most people do um like a lot more like twice as good twice as well as most people do um right so um uh then yeah so it will depend what what the room is like and what you're doing in the room and um the climate and that kind of thing on a hot sunny day you can get a warm updraft up the hot wall how does this affect the results Hmm, I haven't really thought about that uh, particularly. Um, I think that would be a bit like introducing a heat source at the wall, which is not something I've looked at. Um, if you can assume the room is well mixed, which is sort of what I've been assuming all the way through, 
then um, that would probably help it be better mixed um, than uh, at least indoors. Outdoors, my expectation would be the temperature difference driving the flow between the room and the outside would be lo a lot larger than um, the uh, Uh, <laughs> that would be a lot larger, so like it would be a small effect compared to the flow through the sash window. Uh, was this introduced? Uh, was this understood at a practical level when sash windows were introduced? Um, I don't know actually. I, I don't know as much as I would like to about the actual the history. I need to get a historian um, to help me out. Um, I suspect it was uh, because. Um, uh, yeah, uh, my guess would be yes, uh, because it, it's about maximising the height difference across which um, you are putting your temperature difference. So the maximising the potential energy you can extract from the flow. Uh, right, so let's see. Um, um, yes, uh, someone's suggesting I should make um, publicity materials. Um, I agree and, um, and I think that's a, a very good idea. Um, uh, case windows. Um, Right. Would vents in similar positions be as efficient as a sash window? In other words, is it sensible to have windows provide both light and ventilation? Um, certainly, like, I mean, if you had an opening which was the same size as uh, half the height of a sash window and uh, two openings at the same places, but like opaque in the middle, um, it would work exactly the same, although obviously um, the, the, one of the nice things about sash window is you can arrange it in different ways um, so you can reduce the flow by um, reducing the size of the opening or by um, just having one opening if you want there to be a lot of mixing then um, then that kind of uh, is maybe more useful than just having static openings um, right uh, Oh, okay. Yeah, so um, if I have any advice for engineers, try and convince architects to use sash windows rather than those with only one opening to maximise energy efficient natural ventilation. How might you tell them in a simple way? Oh, this is a really good question. And I really wish I knew the answer to it because I feel like I'm doing this a lot. I think sash, I think natural ventilation, um, so ventilation that's driven by wind and by buoyancy is becoming more and more underused. Like we become really attached to these big glass buildings that you have to cool through mechanical means because there's so much radiation, there's so much heat going in that um, you have to use an enormous amount of energy to keep them cool. Um, and I think there's been this move away in architecture uh, because of air conditioning, uh, away from buildings that work for the climate that they're in. Um, and I think moving back towards buildings that, that work as buildings without needing to use these very high um, energy, uh, like very carbon hungry um, ventilation systems is really important. Um, there's a huge amount of energy associated with cooling buildings um, and, he and keeping buildings warm in, in winter. And I think um, particularly cooling is going to become more and more of an issue and you have to design the buildings such that they can, um, uh, they, they, they won't be as crazy expensive um, and carbon hungry to, to cool. Um, so I think I would, I would, I would go the energy efficiency and, and creating buildings that work for the climate that they're in, rather than just ignore the environment um, that they're in. Uh, right. If you ventilate a two-story house, do you get much better flow by having maximum size openings in the sash windows on both floors. Yes, I think you would. Um, I think you need to make sure that you keep the windows opening, the, the, sorry, the doors open between the two rooms that have the sash windows. But potentially from that, you could get um, a much larger uh, flow rate through the bottom and out the top. 
um, because the two windows would sort of be communicating. Uh, does it make a big difference how close to the ceiling the window is placed? Um, it depends. So it won't make a difference to the flow rate out through the window because it's just the height of the actual window that matters. It's possible for warm air to get trapped near the ceiling of a room um, if the top of the window is too far from the top of the ceiling. Um, so that's sort of one thing that might happen. Like you kind of saw that in the video of sash windows that I showed, um, uh, where towards the end of the video, there was just this layer of red fluid above the top of the windows that couldn't be removed because um, it couldn't get out the window. Uh, is there an optimal way to use sash windows to ventilate while minimizing heat loss in the room? Um, so for a given ventilation rate, you're always going to it's going to be sort of equal to a given um, heat flux in because you always have to you know if you're bringing so much air into the space to keep it at the same temperature you have to heat all that air, that air up so there isn't like a way to do that in a way that's like more or less energy efficient because it's just that's the amount of energy you need uh, but if you want to uh, ventilate a room and it's very cold outside probably what you want to do is just open the top bit of the window instead of both bits because then um, you can enhance mixing between the ingoing and outgoing streams of uh, fluid and that will mean that when the air comes down and kind of moves throughout the room it will already be kind of warmed up a little bit like the edge will be taken off um, so, it won't, so it won't kind of create a cold draft so that's like one way one situation where you might want to use the um, window in like the least effective way in terms of flow rate um you looked at a single room does this scale up for a multi-floor house with windows open on more than one level or does it all become horribly complex so it does become complicated but um the sort of general rules are still true like you still will get more flow if you have uh, two openings um and uh although you know you you won't get exactly the same but like if you have wind bringing into the mix you can you can get more complicated but you won't get less ventilation with wind than you would otherwise. So um, you can still kind of use it to, to get kind of rules of thumb, but it, things can get quite complicated if you want to get like exact values. Um, uh, right. Building on the point about particulate matter, could opening one window only provide a sort of filter of articulates, similar to the point you made about having a window open in cold weather? So I don't think um, it wouldn't really, you, you'd reduce the concentration a bit in the incoming air um, of any particulate matter that was outside and not inside, but you wouldn't reduce the amount that's coming in. Like, um, like the amount that comes in would be however much, like whatever the concentration, concentration is multiplied by the ventilation flow rate you've got. So it wouldn't, um, I don't think it would make very much difference from that. Uh, and you can't really put a filter over the window because stuff driven by buoyancy is, the pressure differences are quite small, so often can't overcome a large um, pressure drop across a filter, so. Um, yeah, uh, so results to people in charge of it, uh, absolutely. Um, uh, it's always good to talk to people who, uh, interested in natural ventilation and particularly people who are interested in building regulations um, like such as SIBSI. Um, we've already put some of our research in the SIBSI newsletter. It was looking at um, the effect of temperature on cross ventilation. Um, so yeah, it's a very important route for information distribution. Um, presumably this works less well if it's hotter air outside at the lower part of the window, for my window, I think the concrete produces hot air just above it. Oh, that is interesting. Yeah, I am always pretty much assuming that the air outside is cooler than the air inside, because that's true most of the time. Um, I mean, not in really hot countries, but in that case, you sort of don't really have an option. Um, and even then, most of the time it is cooler outside. Um, uh, yeah, so in, in that case, it might be a bit tricky because um, 
it depends like how close to the concrete you are. Um, but yeah, potentially that could be an issue. Uh, sash windows are not popular in new builds now. What is the environmental impact of retrofitting compared with the potential benefit to the environment of sash window on improved ventilation? So I would say uh, retrofitting for natural ventilation, so not specifically sash windows, but any sort of ventilation where ventilation is being uh, forced by like the natural forces of wind and temperature is, uh, is, is good, although it has to be done carefully. You can't just... Um, but I think also just um, encouraging uh, kind of natural, uh, natural ventilation in new build and also in retrofit uh, is a good idea. So like, but not, yeah, not necessarily specifically such windows, but that sort of thing. Um, okay. Uh, I have normal windows hinged on one side with quarter uh, lights at the top, they're hinged on the top edge. Uh, I'm guessing that to get the best cooling, I just need to open them all as wide as possible. Yeah, that's pretty much true. Like if you want to just cool your room, then open them as widely as possible because the height is just um, the thing that's forcing the flow and that height is just a, a constant thing. Um, uh, right. In a modern house uh, with a three plane window, can the same ventilation effect be created as a sash window? By opening the left and right windows with a fixed plane being closed. Uh, should the windows be open to give the summation of the open gap size equal to the middle pane, middle fixed pane size? Uh, I don't quite get the second bit. So the so if you have um, pane like panes side by side, um, then it's just the height of individual windows that matters, and you just open all of them. It's not having two openings that matters. It's having two. Op it's having the maximum height difference between the top of the top opening and the bottom of the bottom opening. Like that's the thing you want to maximize. So if you have vertical windows um, that have a fixed height, you just want the largest opening area possible. Uh. So if tall windows also work well, does the sash as an obstruction enhance or reduce the airflow? So it reduces the airflow, but not as much as you might expect, given that, like how much of the window it blocks. So um, if you just have an opening, just a constant opening, um, and you have exchange flow across the opening, the flow is really fast at the top and the bottom, and it decreases, it gets towards the middle and becomes zero. And it doesn't do this linearly, it's like a quadratic. So there's like the most of the flow is going right through the right at the top of the window and right at the bottom of the window. So when you put in a sash, you block a region where there's not that much exchange anyway. So it doesn't reduce the flow as much as you might expect. Right, uh, I think I've got time for maybe three more questions. Um, uh, is there an optimum size window for maximum ventilation? Well, um, basically the optimum size window is as big as you can make it. Obviously there's some restrictions around that in terms of the wall and the um, building. Um, so uh, it's more just sort of like how we arrange an opening for a sash really makes a huge difference as to how much ventilation we get. Um, <laughs> and what is the best configuration for getting rid of viruses from a room? This is suddenly a rather important question, I agree. Um, more ventilation, the better, um, essentially is what it comes down to. Uh, I would say probably as well, like having openings at the top and the bottom is, is also a good idea. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, this is a good time to make sure you're ventilating your buildings well, particularly if you're sharing rooms with people who aren't from your household, for example. Um, so it's, it's definitely worth, um, enhancing the ventilation as much as you can. Um, I wanted to keep this a little bit lighthearted, so I didn't want to talk about COVID all the time. So, um, but I could have done. <laughs> um, right. Uh, right. If you, want to, if you want to control ventilation in cold conditions, uncontrolled ventilation is often associated with loose fitting sashes. Did you look at sash window efficiency from this view? 
Um, yeah, so, well, I mean, you, you sort of drafts and also um, uh, uh, like, uh, like a high, um, uh, like a, bu buildings that have a, a surprisingly high kind of ventilation rate given there weren't any obvious openings, um, leaky buildings, um, sometimes can be, can be good rather than bad. It sort of depends exactly what you want to do. Um, there's been a lot of focus on making sure buildings aren't leaky. Um, yeah, so I haven't really looked at like how how tight fitting you can make sash windows. That's not really something I've I've researched. Um, but yeah, it's definitely an interesting question. Uh, right, is salt the only thing that was used to change the viscosity of the water? Tells you keeping Reynolds number in the same range as the real world room or window. So uh, the salt doesn't really change the viscosity of the water. It changes the density because salt water is more dense than fresh water. Uh, the viscosity of water is different from air in the same way that viscosity of honey is different from the viscosity of water. Um, but because water and air also have different densities um, and it's really the viscosity divided by the density that matters. Uh, the viscosity divided by the density for for water is a factor of 10 different from the viscosity of air divided by the density of air, um, which means that uh, when I scale down my experiment by a factor of 10, it comes to uh, the, same, the same thing. Uh, right. Um, Right. Uh, yeah, I've been talking to people about ventilation a lot recently, unsurprisingly. So yes, I have been trying to spread this information in the right place. So I should read out the question. Um, do you think this research has implications for health? Uh, yes, I think uh, ventilation is important and often like um, underappreciated in buildings. Uh, quite a lot of um, pollution actually comes from inside the house, not just outside the house. Everyone's always really worried about cars, which obviously can be a problem, but um, cooking is also a big issue, like frying something creates an awful lot of PM 2.5. So um, uh, having good ventilation in our buildings, even under normal circumstances, is, is a good idea. Um, currently, it's, it's really, really crucial. Um, right. Uh, and I think I will end it there, given that our time is up. And I hope you enjoy uh, the rest of uh, the, uh, the Alumni Festival. And thank you very much for listening.